Okay, so welcome uh, everybody, and uh, I'm glad uh, to present uh, the speaker of today uh, within these uh, cycles of seminars related to physics of data and uh, societal challenges. And uh, today we have uh, as a guest uh, Professor Paolo Dodorico from the Department of Environmental Science, uh, Policy and Management uh, of the University of California, Berkeley. So Paolo is a friend and a collaborator, and uh, he's an hydrologist by training, let's say. He did uh, his PhD uh, in Padova, and um, then he moved to the United States, where uh, after several uh, uh, universities, uh, he lands in uh, Berkeley. So I'm glad that, that Paolo can uh, somehow show a broad overview of uh, a part of his research. He has a really a very broad range of topics that uh, he tackles in his uh, group. And uh, one of these is about uh, threat to sustainability under climate and societal change, that I think is a very relevant uh, issue today to also understand from a more uh, uh, data point of view. So today, of course, the focus will be how data and also models can help us to better understand what's going on and uh, if you are interested of uh, any of these topics that uh, he will present, uh, of course, we can also try to understand the possibilities of uh, collaboration, uh, thesis, and uh, so on. Okay, so thank you, Paolo, for being here. Thank you, Samir. Thank you for coming today and for the invitation. I'll, um, uh, I seldom talk to audiences of, from physics, so I don't know if what I'm going to talk about will be of interest to you. We uh, will uh, a central theme for today will be the globalization. I don't know if the sound is okay. Yeah, and um, and uh, we live in a globalized world in which commodities, ideas, uh, and uh, uh, influence uh, are uh, uh, teleconnected, and uh, there is a lot of integration through different networks uh, of uh, physical transport of, of materials, but also uh, through internet and uh, through uh, uh, social media, etc. There is a lot of uh, uh, sharing and uh, uh, ways in which one part of the world can uh, affect another part of the world. And uh, we will focus in particular on the effect of trade in the context of sustainability. And the main thing when we look at the environment and uh, um, one of the main impacts of human activities on the environment is the production of food and also of energy. But the production of food because uh, agriculture uh, affects a large uh, tracts of uh, land on, on Earth has an impact on climate, has an impact on uh, the use of resources. And there is a, a, an increase in demand for agricultural commodities associated with population growth, with changes in lifestyles, particularly the adoption of, uh, of diets that are richer in meat, and meat uh, production requires more land, more water, more resources. And then uh, also the use of biofuels in recent years has been a new um, uh, uh, an additional uh, uh, demand for agricultural commodities, and so with the, the associated uh, impacts. And when we look at population growth, we see that uh, um, th there has been an, an acceleration. We talk about the great acceleration that happened since the Industrial Revolution. So it took the whole history of humanity to reach one billion people, in, and, and this was the early 1800s. And then there has been a, a little over a century to the second billion, and then we have been adding uh, to the planet uh, one billion people every 14 years. This has been possible because of the innovations of the industrial revolution, of course, of progress in medical uh, research, etc. But uh, overall, to feed the, so many people, it's been possible thanks to mechanization through the industrial revolution, through the so-called green revolution, the adoption, in particular, the invention of uh, uh, fertilizers and uh, uh, the uh, adoption of irrigation uh, in areas that were not irrigated before. And this led to uh, an unprecedented increase in the production of, of food on the planet to the point that at some point food crops were used to feed the livestock and to uh, and this allowed for an increase also in the meat production and in uh, the last three or four decades there has been an acceleration of international trade and so in a way that the resources produced in one place are transferred somewhere else 
And uh, this led us at some point to this uh, idea that we will never, the planet, will, uh, humanity will have never run out of food until we had uh, this, uh, the new food, global food crisis after years with no global food crisis in 2007, 2011. And this means that we reached a one, uh, at some point, in a world of limited resources, there is something else became a limiting factor, and land and water resources are uh, some of them. So here in this figure, I show so this. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, I know. Should I? I should, this figure here shows that uh, uh, as uh, societies become more affluent, they tend to consume more meat, and meat uses uh, uh, more natural resources. Uh, there has been a lot of, uh, I mentioned this because some of you might be interested in uh, the study of dynam dynamics of population, etc. So Malthus is always uh, uh, considered uh, uh, as a milestone in the discussion of population growth, the idea that the population grows faster than the uh, resources to feed the, that population. And he uh, had this, uh, um, he was uh, um, uh, anticipating that there would have been a catastrophe at some point, that there would have been uh, uh, um, the population, uh, the planet, would, uh, uh, or the, res uh, uh, the resources of the planet would have not been sufficient to uh, to feed the, uh, uh, so many people. This didn't happen because of the industrial, uh, because of the innovation of the green revolution. <laughs> And then there was this idea that more people would have also come up always with new technological solutions to allow to, for, uh, to sustain uh, this uh, population. And so the attention was shifted from a problem of a supply of food to a problem, an economic problem, Nobel Prize for Economics, Amartya Sen, argued that there is, uh, during the, the famines, he studied quite a few event, uh, famine uh, cases, the food existed, but was a problem of physical and economic access. And uh, so this means that uh, in the following decades, the whole discussion of food security shifted from uh, a problem of uh, availability and environmental resources to uh, a focus on economics. The problem is that this uh, discussion has been dominated too much by economists. And they can, if you go into a meeting with them, they would always say it's an economic problem, it's not an environmental problem. This is because there is enough supply. And so what we tend to show, what the research in the last few decades has been showing, is that the reason why there is enough food to feed everyone is because this food is produced unsustainably. Using resources, I'm not referring to the consumption of, of uh, fossil fuels, but I'm referring to the fact that the land is eroded, uh, water resources are depleted, particularly groundwater, and so at some point we are going to reach a, a limit in which they, in the long run it's impossible, will not be possible to keep uh, feeding so many people with the resources we uh, have available now for agriculture. And so this... Uh, um, uh, and this is uh, uh, what we are going to show today. One of these resource, limiting resources is water, and the most of the water used by human societies uh, to feed the world, and, uh, and is used for, uh, uh, mainly for agriculture. And uh, we tend to use uh, water in two different ways, both the rainwater directly, but also irrigation water. Uh, so some of the land, 20% of the land is irrigated. In this map we show, we did an analysis with the global uh, model. We looked uh, per every area, we divided the world in pixels. We looked uh, at, uh, for every pixel of 10 or 50 kilometers, so very big. Uh, we looked at uh, the amount of water needed to irrigate that land. This is all irrigated land uh, in the year 2000. Um, where this irrigation was sustainable, so where the irrigation water requirements could be met in a way that uh, the water consumption is uh, less than the uh, runoff minus the environmental flows. If we don't want to have rivers uh, running dry, we would need to force this, uh, impose this condition, or vice versa, unsustainable if it's, uh, the consumption is greater than the lo local runoff, uh, which includes both surface and groundwater runoff, minus the environmental flows. What we obtain in peak are areas, and this is 40% of the irrigated areas, are uh, irrigated unsustainably, which stresses again how much of the food production is uh, uh, produced unsustainably, just by looking at uh, uh, water consumption. Of course, energy also requires a lot of water, but it's much less than that. But this is possible only because uh, we uh, rely on uh, water, uh, we rely on fossil fuels. So fossil fuels basically is organic matter that has been fossilized but existed in, on the planet millions of years ago. 
So if we, uh, which means that back then at the time there were plants growing that used some water. So virtually we are using some ancient water to sustain uh, today's energy demand. And so we try to, it's impossible to quantify this amount of water because we didn't know what climate was there, what plants uh, contributed to that organic matter. We did a simple exercise replacing fossil fuels with biofuels. And you, you have seen a lot of this already done in terms of of the competition between uh, uh, the energy sector and the food sector because of biofuels. But we can just even look at water. We did the replacement in which uh, coal is replaced by wood, uh, uh, gas is replaced by ethanol, and oil, uh, crude oil is uh, replaced by uh, uh, biodiesel. And if we do this, uh, we find that the, um, the amount of water needed is this big number here. This number is equal to the total evapotranspiration from all terrestrial ecosystems. So the whole water cycle will barely um, uh, uh, be able to support our energy needs every year. And uh, uh, we, this, uh, by replacing all ecosystems, all no agriculture, everything would go for, uh, all the water would go only for uh, uh, energy. This is just to stress how also in this uh, is often a political debate about biofuels. Of course, if rather than throwing away um, some biomass, we can make some um, uh, energy out of it, but we cannot replace uh, or sustain our energy demand with uh, uh, biofuels. And because the water cycle would not allow us to do that. And so virtually we are using water from the past to, to meet today's energy needs. Hence the uh, interest in all other forms of renewables that are not based on, fossil, uh, on fuels, but are based on solar or, uh, um, or could be hydrogen or could be, um, uh, or could be also uh, the um, solar or, or eolian. So the, the strategy is to increase food production. And I, the premise is that uh, one of the pathways to food security is to reduce waste and reduce uh, uh, consumption with uh, more sustainable diets, etc. But if we were to increase production, there are two possible strategies or a mix of these two. We can either keep the same uh, cultivated land and uh, intensify, so increase the yields on that land, or we can expand, uh, expand agriculture and uh, uh, to other uh, areas. Of course, this means more deforestation, loss of habitat and carbon emissions. So that preferential pathway is usually is this one, is this idea of intensifying agriculture. And if we did some calculations and we intensify agriculture, we can feed uh, about 4 billion people by doing that. But these analyses don't account for the fact that to increase yield, yield, agricultural yields, we need to irrigate, and to irrigate, we need to have water. If we look at the limitations, we see that uh, all these uh, in pink and blue are the irrigated areas that we have seen before, the areas that are currently irrigated. In blue, in, in green and yellow, are areas where we can expand irrigation. Yellow are areas where the irrigation would be unsustainable. So overall, we can feed only 2 point, only, so 2.8 billion people instead of four, if we account for this water limitation. And then if we remove the unsustainable irrigation, we go down to 1.8, and even less if we account for seasonalities. And so this, uh, uh, we, this is uh, uh, the total uh, uh, agricultural area is uh, um, if you look at a condition, we can skip this one because probably is not very uh, relevant. I wanted to show where this, I was supposed, they, where this potentially uh, for irrigation expansion is uh, mostly in Eastern Europe and the Sub-Saharan Africa. And so now food production and uh, food consumption uh, because also of water limitation, but also because of the economics that is behind that and the uh, dependence uh, on different uh, systems of production, we see that uh, some parts of the world are not self-sufficient. And this is in current conditions. For example, we, some parts of Europe, uh, uh, some African countries, etc., are, are um, if we come, there is a mismatch between production and consumption, and so they are trade dependent. And so many parts of the world, in fact, uh, and are all the red areas in these maps uh, are net importers of food. And, uh, and basically, this lack of self-sufficiency is possible because of, uh, because of trade. And over the last uh, 30 years, there has been an increase in uh, trade. About 24% of the food is accessed through international trade. 
and also the distance to food on average uh, the minimum distance to food is depends on the commodity or on the agricultural commodity based thousands of kilometers so so much as, as much as we like local food movements uh, this is not an option for everyone because of these trade dependencies which are really determined both by the economy by by the distribution of natural resources but also the economics in some countries the local systems of production have been displaced by economic systems that allow to put on the market uh, agricultural commodities at a lower price because of subsidies, for example, in the United States. Associated with the uh, uh, trade of co food commodities, there is a trade of water in the sense that uh, the uh, water resources uh, exist in one place contribute to the production of commodities that uh, then are shipped to the other parts of the world. So, for example, North Africa and the Middle East are in a condition of critical, uh, chronic uh, water scarcity because they can rely on, on water that is imported virtually with the food commodities, not physically in the food commodity, but it went into the production of this commodity. And Samir Swayze has been working on this uh, uh, much longer than me. So, the, uh, but the, what we did was this uh, reconstruction of these patterns of international trade. As you see, there is a lot, in particular recently, from South America to, to, to China, is a lot of so, soybeans that go into, uh, are used as a feed for uh, 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 pigs. And this is the, again, more doubly, uh, than doubled the trade of uh, uh, virtual water in, in the last few decades. And so uh, future projections with increasing meat consumption, etc., show even more uh, depend, uh, la, uh, more or, or less tra uh, trade independency. Uh, and so more trade dependency over time and uh, more dependence uh, on an increase in uh, globalization of the food systems. And there are, of course, some vulnerabilities because of the fact that some parts of the world depends on resources controlled by other parts of the world. And we all know about this case of the war in Ukraine, which is a breadbasket of the world, how many countries, uh, particularly in North Africa and the Middle East, are in a condition of panic because uh, uh, they were strongly depending on the uh, wheat from, uh, uh, from Ukraine and the Black Sea uh, region. And also there are also conditions of vulnerability because at uh, some point uh, even the transport system can go enter into a crisis. There, are, there was an, this analysis of choke points so a lot of the world trade goes through these uh, um, bottlenecks. And a few years ago, uh, there was this uh, uh, ship that was uh, 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 stuck there in the Suez Canal. All the traffic uh, had to stop. And then uh, it was a, a big problem also with global supplies. So when, uh, what we are going to say now, uh, we, want to, we can see how this uh, uh, globalization of food affects the resiliency uh, of, of the uh, food system. And uh, we will also consider the case in which, uh, and this is the case, uh, the natural resources uh, are, have dynamics that exhibit alternatives. In the sense that many, many uh, ecosystems tend to um, work in a way that uh, if they are disturbed before, beyond this critical threshold, they shift to an alternative state from which they don't uh, they recover but with a hysteresis let's see if so let's assume that uh, this is a grassland or even agricultural land and we increase uh, the harvest of resources or can be a forest or we can the use of these resources and at some point we don't see a big change but at some point we reach a critical point and a further change make us shift to this alternative attractor at this point even if we remove the pressure we would move along this um, okay of course i knew it. we would move along this other um, branch of the, the, this uh, bifurcation di diagram. So the system would re remain locked in this uh, uh, low, s s um, more unsustainable uh, state. So if this is the premise, we can look at, uh, uh, and this can be the case uh, okay, of overgrazing or over uh, plowing the land and so on. Many systems behave like this. So even the system, uh, if we have time with pollen pollinators can exhibit these alternative uh, uh, attractors. And so they, just to give the, the general definition, uh, it's silly for me to do it in the physics department, but uh, stable is basically when you displace from uh, the system from the state and recovers uh, the initial uh, state. The resilience is defined usually as an attribute of a, a stable state in a way that um, 
is that how uh, expresses how easily the system can recover the state uh, uh, after a, a disturbance. In particular, when we have a system with alternative attractors, there is a more limited resilience because if you disturb it beyond the critical threshold, you diverge it to the alternative attractor. And so the ecologists give a, a, a more of a descriptive definition to capture this type of, um, of dynamics. And um, we, again, we go back to the food, uh, global food system. And uh, we look at, uh, we have done quite a bit of work in our collaboration, looking at short-term response, uh, long-term response of the systems. And, uh, um, and in particular, we have been uh, uh, looking at cases in which you force one point, you look at how the propagation, uh, uh, the, the perturbation propagates. Other cases in which we looked more at, this, uh, at um, a stability with respect to um, uh, small uh, perturbation and uh, to see uh, basically the linear stability, study the linear stability of the system. And then at some point we have been looking at the stability of the system on the whole long-term stability. And uh, we have these dynamics that have alternative attractors. And then we want to put them in a, in a network. And we see how the network overall, this would be the network of dynamics that are all at every point are bistable. We, and we look at the, the dynamics of the system as a whole. And so, and how is this system, what drives the resilience of uh, this system? And so basically we have resources that uh, dynamics of resources that uh, can be expressed in this way. There is a local term expressed by this uh, local function here. And then there is a term of trade because the resources at a point can be accessed also from input or, or lost through exports to other sites. And so this would be, for example, if you want to express this by stable dynamics, we have a nulli effect with logistic growth with a nulli effect. And then we have this minus exports plus imports. And we relied on this study uh, by a uh, Gao, uh, show that um, um, compiles together all these uh, local uh, dynamics in this way. Basically, let's see if we have uh, at every point the dynamics are expressed in this way. So i is a node, and then we have uh, a certain number of n nodes, and then we define uh, these are the local dynamics, exports and imports. Then we uh, define an operator that is uh, captured, it's not an average, but basically uh, the uh, global behavior in a way that we, uh, we look at the dynamics across the whole network. And by doing this uh, type of averaging, we, t we find a, an effective variable, R effective, that, are, uh, that is expressed in this way. If we plot it, we still find dynamics that have uh, these alternative uh, attractors where uh, what is interesting now is that uh, we have a, a, um, a, a certain uh, bifurcation point, which is this eta f, which depends on the structure of the, of the network. So eta um, and um, so the and the, oh, sorry. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, this is the mouse. So basically, we replace the local dynamics expressed as a function of i with this global dynamics through this uh, and we uh, and this is the uh, bifurcation point, uh, this point here, which depends on the, uh, the um, network uh, properties. Now we want to see how this uh, uh, this character, uh, this uh, parameter. Uh, changes with the nature, uh, network structure. And uh, in particular, we want to see how uh, by um, um, how this uh, okay, can be done in this way. Um, it changes with the connectivity on the network, which measures the globalization of this uh, uh, network. And uh, you can see that uh, by increasing the connectivity, this uh, eta f decreases, which means that if we are on this uh, branch of the curve, we move this way. So the system becomes more resilient uh, as uh, the system becomes more uh, connected. And uh, um, at the same time, and so this is reflected by the fact that the, the probability of being in uh, uh, 
in a, a sustainable state uh, increases uh, by increasing the connectivity of the network. This is because uh, by increasing connectivity, it uh, goes down, and so we are moving along this uh, uh, branch of the axis. But this depends on the characteristics uh, of the network. This is a, a random network. We will consider that then two other types of networks, we call them heterogeneous or homogeneous. So the difference between these two is that in, one of, in the heterogeneous network, uh, they, uh, there is an inverse relationship between uh, the out degree and the uh, in degree of uh, uh, every node. So, so I think you are familiar with the term of degree is the number of, of nodes that are con uh, uh, of uh, edges that are connected to a, a node. And, um, and when we do that, what we uh, find, um, uh, so here we generate uh, these synthetic networks with the uh, different, uh, uh, um, so in this case, uh, this is the result uh, for the random network. We saw that it decreases with the uh, connectivity. And so we have a higher probability of being in the sustainable state uh, as we increase the connectivity. Then we have the homogeneous uh, uh, network. So it has a positive relationship between in degrees and out degrees uh, across nodes. And so in this case, it's a flat thing. So there is no particular sensitivity uh, to the connectivity of the network. In the third case, instead, the connectivity of the network, with the, uh, uh, as the connectivity of the network increases, the eta f increases, which means that uh, if we are on here, over uh, increase the connectivity, we move close to this bifurcation point, eventually even, uh, dropping down to, to the unsustainable state. In this heterogeneous network, we have an inverse relationship between the number of in degrees and out degrees. And so, the, this means that the probability of being in the sustainable state dramatically drops by increasing the connectivity. Then um, uh, and we can show that also with model simulation, we did the, the average uh, resource level as a function of connectivity in the random network. It goes up because we saw that the eta f goes down. And in this instead, in the uh, heterogeneous uh, network, uh, it drops. So there, so there is a, the, what we are trying to show here is that the globalization has the impact of reducing the uh, resilience of uh, the network. And so this uh, um, result, then uh, uh, we try to test with the real uh, data using data from the FAO on the global uh, food network. And uh, what we find empirically is that uh, over time, there has been an increase in connectivity, which means, uh, would mean that, that uh, if the network is heterogeneous, then we would have seen a decrease in resilience. If it's random, it's the other way around. And so then uh, we also look at the probability of being in the sustainable state empirically, we saw the, this uh, uh, drop. And so this, uh, um, the question then whether we, we see show then later that the uh, actual network of food trade is heterogeneous and so the process of globalization of food leads to a, a drop in resilience in the food system and so uh, we looked at that other uh, property of the network the modularity which uh, shows to what extent trade is regional so there are a set of nodes that are more, uh, more connected among themselves than with the rest of the network is shown in this figure here. And so we uh, looked at the case of the homogeneous network. Overall, there is a small increase in ETAF with modularity, but in, for this parameterization, it always remained below the critical state, which means that uh, the uh, dynamics remained uh, in the sustainable state. But uh, in the uh, heterogeneous network, uh, there is a, a, um, um, a drop in eta f with increasing in modularity, which means that uh, an increase in modularity tends to uh, make this, this, the stable state, the sustainable state, more uh, resilient. And so we... Um, checked how modularity has been changing over time in this empirical network. Unfortunately, we see that there has been a decrease in modularity. So it means that we should read this figure in this direction over time. There has been a decrease in modularity making the stable state less resilient. So this is interesting because it shows how the topology of the network plays an important role in, this, in the uh, resilience of the sustainable configuration of the uh, um, network 
looking at uh, particularly uh, at the properties of the food trade network that drives the globalization of food. And so empirically, we see that uh, um, two things that are quite interesting. First of all, we have seen that the connectivity has been increasing over time already before we were showing that uh, the trade system has become in increasingly integrated and increase in uh, um, and so we, we have seen this increase in connectivity and increasing connectivity in an heterogeneous network leads to a, 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 a reduction in a resilience and so in fact we see these are empirical points for different for the network we see in the more recent years we are more around the they say the nose the, this bifurcation point of the this uh, diagram and also here we see over time the parameter eta f has been uh, has been increasing which means that there has been a loss in resilience let's look at modularity and uh, um, so this is still connectivity, okay, and uh, so and the modularity, we have seen that there has been a drop in modularity over time, and the drop of modularity in a heterogeneous network uh, corresponds to a loss in resilience. And so we can uh, uh, check if the empirical network, uh, trade network is uh, um, heterogeneous or not, and we did a statistical test and we showed that uh, we were able to show that it is heterogeneous. So it has uh, all the attributes of a network that with the increasing um, globalization, and so because of increasing connectivity and the decreasing modularity, so decreasing regionalization, we have a, a loss of uh, resilience. And um, with this, uh, I uh, wanted to, we can shift to a different type of topic. And I try to put the two things that I think are very interesting from the point of view uh, to have some sort of a theme uh, of networks, food security and sustainability, and critical transition induced by uh, this nonlinearity in the system. I'm looking, we can look at, at the network of a model uh, of pollinators. And so the, uh, this is a topic that uh, I know also uh, Samir Swayze has been very much uh, interested in and uh, over time. And the interesting thing here is that uh, there has been a, a drop uh, and is reported in the news every year in uh, the amount of pollinators that exist uh, in, in the world. And uh, this is critical because uh, of the fact that food security strongly depends on, and, and in general, the, the uh, plant ecology strong, strongly depends on the presence of pollinators. This drop of pollinator is not, uh, didn't happen gradually. Something that happened uh, historically pretty abruptly, which suggested the underlying dynamics could have a critical transition, could have this by stable uh, states uh, that, and with a, a, a point and uh, at which uh, an additional disturbance leads to a, a collapse. So what I've seen in the literature uh, uh, about the collapse of pollinators, most of the studies have been trying to relate them to something similar to what we have seen before. So to the, uh, some nonlinear properties of the uh, networks of uh, uh, plants and uh, pollinators. But there is another way to have this catastrophic, uh, this abrupt shift in this type of dynamics is uh, through positive feedbacks. And the positive feedback is, uh, uh, can work in this way. It is an initial disturbance on, uh, uh, let's uh, consider a simple system in which we have one plant and uh, one uh, pollinator. If we disturb the plant uh, and we reduce the abundance of the plant, uh, at some point as a result, uh, there is less food for the pollinator. And uh, if there is a drop in pollinator's population, the plant to, uh, has the option of uh, uh, doing self-pollination. It's called selfing. By doing selfing, the uh, plant can still be, uh, uh, there is a phenomenon of inbreeding, and the plant uh, um, and the quality of the pollen and the nectar is lower. The nutritional properties of that is lower, which uh, can reduce the food available to the pollinator. You can see that there is a positive feedback in this system. And because of this positive feedback, you can have uh, this, uh, the, uh, two alternative stable states that uh, lead to the, can lead to the collapse of the pollinators. It is, uh, basically, inbreeding is not a good thing in the long term, but in the absence of pollinators, plants don't have any other option than doing this, but they produce less uh, 
uh, nutritious nectar for the, to sustain a po population of pollinators. Just to put this uh, very descriptive thing into equations, and we have done it. This is a very simple. These are simple, uh, mostly logistic equation in which a carrying capacity represents really the food available to the pollinators. And so we uh, looked at these dynamics, and we can have this type of things. So this is uh, the. Um, Plant, uh, the two things are related because uh, plants, uh, they need each other. This is a, um, a mutualistic system. And so we, we see that uh, there is an a, a, a increasing of disturbance level. There is a critical point uh, beyond which the system uh, shifts to the uh, alternative state. The same both for plants and uh, for pollinator. We can look at disturbance of pollinator or, or uh, also the same thing for, for the disturbance of plants. Now, uh, ecologists would uh, react by saying, but plants and pollinators is not that you have one pollinator, one plant. You have butterflies, you have bees, and you have different types of, of uh, uh, flora. And so we can look at uh, the, their network and put them together. And so this, uh, uh, and there are empirical networks uh, uh, of uh, uh, plant pollinators. This is a global map of them. And also you can see that there are different, uh, um, uh, different, um, uh, um, uh, yeah, we, here in the example we show later, we will use the, this Mauritius uh, network from the Mauritius, but there is a global network and there are also interesting recurrent properties of this. So the plant dynamics can be, again, a logistic growth with a disturbance term. And the growth accounts needs to account for this selfing effect because of the fact that there is a, a because of the fact that uh, um, a drop in pollinator uh, leads plants to do this uh, uh, selfing, so leading to some inbreeding. So you, I don't want to bore you with the equation. What we see in this case is that uh, um, uh, a disturbance of pollinators uh, leads to, uh, again, a critical transition both in, uh, the, uh, in the plant biomass and in the pollinator biomass. And uh, this uh, one thing I wanted to show here uh, because it can be of interest, uh, is that uh, NP uh, is the, the number of pollinators uh, and uh, uh, now the number of plant species, so is the plant diversity, and uh, in NP is uh, the network uh, connectance. And so it represents what uh, uh, some uh, early ecologists like Robert May would have called the complexity of the network. And so we can see uh, how, the, uh, if we look uh, just a stability analysis based on, uh, and look at uh, linear stability analysis and plot here the eigenvalue, uh, we see that, uh, uh, and it's shown in this figure here, as we increase the diversity, we have uh, that uh, the system becomes more, more stable. And so this is counter to the, uh, what was uh, uh, shown in the early work based on uh, random matrices, et cetera, that an increase in diversity instead would have led to uh, a, a, a more unstable and res less resilient uh, uh, system. So I summarize this information here. This is something that uh, also uh, Professor Maritan has been working on and also some years space, right? Uh, you were working in uh, these systems uh, and this is, uh, uh, shows that uh, the stability complexity paradox, if you account for, first of all, this is a system that has a, a network, which I think is called bipartite network, it's a little bit different, uh, and, uh, and it's not random for sure, and then it has uh, uh, this positive feedback inside. But anyway, uh, what we found is that uh, the increasing complexity of the network, so biodiversity makes the pollen pollinator system more resilient, which is something that ecologists will love because it's a clear message. And, uh, and also uh, the um, connectivity of the network, uh, of the pollen pollinator network, so it's very important in sustaining its uh, resilience. And with this, uh, I'm almost, uh, almost seems to be perfect timing. They, we looked at long-term sustainability of social environmental networks uh, and uh, systems with alternative stable states uh, and uh, that are relevant uh, to food security, sustainability. And um, uh, in this network, uh, uh, complex network, so we, we uh, were looking at the resilience and factors uh, that contribute to that, including the connectivity of the network, the size of the network, uh, and the topological properties of these networks. Thank you.
they need some parts to go pick it and ask uh, some more details. <laughs> you wanna see? Sí. Is it sustainable to become vegetarians? <laughs> ah, but this is a different story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think this is uh, the big problem here is uh, how meat uh, is produced. So, in uh, from the point of view, there are some regions of the world that are not suitable for agriculture, but are great land for range and uh, uh, pasture. And uh, in fact, there's been sometimes a mistake to cultivate that land because like to do uh, uh, environmental catastrophes. So to some extent, uh, even uh, uh, in a view, um, unless we are concerned more about animal rights or other aspects of vegetarianism, but from a point of view, sustainable use of resources, many pasture lands are completely uh, sustainable and they've been managed like that for centuries. So there is, um, and instead, when we, humans went to cultivate that land, they caused uh, some problems. Uh, I do some research sometimes in some region of Africa, the Botswana is not a, a land suitable for uh, agriculture, most of it, but it's a great rangeland. Probably the other way around, so other region would be more suitable to eat more vegetable that make maybe making intense uh, meat. Uh... The, the intensive meat production is the concerns because then, because of that, uh, they, uh, um, of course, it takes, if we, uh, instead of feeding uh, livestock with grass, let's think of cattle, we feed them with the crops, or with corn, etc. First of all, that's not the ideal food for the livestock. But also to produce the corn, we need much, uh, a lot of land, water, and resources. And so to produce one calorie of meat, we need uh, uh, much more land and resources than for one calorie of plant food. But of course, that meat, that meat from the point of view of nutritional properties, has much more protein, which is important also for food security. Sorry. Um, is it possible to go back uh, for a moment to um... I think it's a few slides ago. What was what, uh, what was about you, you tell me. Uh, um, resilience equation that you had. Yeah. I keep going. You tell me when. Here, here, yes. Here. Um, maybe it's very stupid. Do you think it's possible to um, explicitly augment the model by uh, also taking into account possible political action? in the sense that maybe um, depletion of some resources may trigger uh, protectionist measures and you could modulate this as um, a decrease in connectivity that becomes dependent on R, for instance, to, because I guess at a certain point, if you're approaching some critical situation, uh, there would be some form of reaction maybe not ideal. Uh, do you think it makes sense to possibly insert this in the model or well, it's too I think, hard? Uh, I don't know if then we can do it an analytically, etc. but uh, for, for sure something like that, uh, since it, it happened, uh, because of many food crises you see, uh, countries that export, uh, the ban exports, and there is a reduction of the supply, so it's like edges in, in, in a network that uh, are removed. And so this goes back to early studies, in fact, on uh, network resilience when uh, they were removing edges and looking at, uh, yeah, for sure, that can be, it could be, in fact, uh, quite interesting to do, yeah. And thank you for the talk, really interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the last point that you make. So you notice a discrepancy between maize, like a kind of classic model and the model that you have of the plant pollinator species. Do you have like an hypothesis or maybe can go into more depth about why do you think like real life systems, which are very complex, do not like, um, yeah, they fail to be described by this, this uh, statement that May was, was suggesting? I think it's mainly because May was using a random matrix. A random matrix, or so it was a random network. And the links in the real networks are, are not random, particularly in this type of systems that you have pollen pollinators. Is it called bipartite network? This, yeah, yes. so in this case, it's not that all nodes are the same. It's, it's definitely not a, a, a random. Uh, I think that there is something also about the dynamics, because even if you don't take random network, but for example, you take uh, the nested structure, 
and you just do linear stability on that network, even if it's not random, you always find um, that the, the more complex, the larger is the network and the less stable it is. So probably in your model, I think that the positive feedback uh, plays a crucial role somehow. No, because when you do linear stability analysis, you don't see the other state because you are in the in this neighborhood of the other state, and so maybe the weights because you are you are doing the Jacobian, so the the values of the. Um, so I think yeah, it's not trivial to understand that result because in general, even if the network are not random, um, you you still find that so. But uh, if there are like uh, some um, trade-off, for example, that uh, the, 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 I don't know, the bees that have the largest number of uh, flower have a very weak interaction or some kind of this trade-off, then it might be that you stabilize. Ah, that's, yeah, yeah, this is true. But you did some work on this, so did you? Oh, yeah, we all do, but uh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, we... yeah, no, no, you do, so I don't remember. Did you see anything like this? Uh, no, we found that unless you don't put any kind of trade-off, uh, even if the network is not random, you have to put something in the dynamics, delay or some trade-off in the strength or other aspects. So probably that's why I, I guess that the fact is that the dynamics is inducing something then in the Jacobian. That is, uh, so stabilized. there are some these trade-offs again between uh, the the dynamics and the, the structure. maybe the the degree of the point and something else in the in, strength, in the coefficient the strength. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Okay. If not, thanks again, Paolo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Some students are interested to to have uh, some question about the project, you can approach Paolo with no, with no problem. Thank you.